sound good. Let's ask for a blessing over our offering. Please bow with me. Father in heaven, such a beautiful day you have made, and we are here to worship your holy name and to rejoice in the fact that Jesus Christ died on a cross for us, that we might have eternal life with you, and every day will be a joyous day. Forgive us our sins, take this offering and receive it in such a way that it will honor you. I ask that uh, everyone give to their heart's just desire. Forgive us for our sins for these things we ask in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. All I want 
Amen. That is who we are here to celebrate, the name of Jesus. Praise the Lord. Thank you all so much for that. That was one of my favorite songs. Marcia did a great job singing the solo part. That is not an easy one to sing, and boy, I get, I get so caught up in that one. That is such a fabulous song. So again, Brother Scott, thank you guys and ladies as well. Y'all, y'all did a great job. I'm a little biased too because I love Lila being up here with Katie and singing, and yeah. It's a, such a wonderful thing to be in the house of the Lord this morning. Well, we had a great time yesterday, didn't we? I thoroughly enjoyed our presentation uh, from Creation Ministries International, and uh, maybe you bought some goodies they had as well. So many wonderful materials out there uh, to where we can defend our faith and tell others about Christ using really the first 11 chapters of the Bible. So it's a really, really neat thing. Uh, But today, speaking of 11, we are going to be in Hebrews chapter 11, and we're going to go through the entire chapter today, which is a pretty daunting task. It's 40 verses. Um, But we're going to start off, if you're willing and able, if you'll stand with me, we're just going to read the first three together. I thought to really punish you and have you, let's do all 40 together, but I I already see some looks. Oh, bless you for doing just three. So... So Hebrews 11, I typically read from the Christian Standard Bible. Uh, If you don't own a Bible, please take one. Uh, Right there in front of you, you should have one. Most of them are New King James. We have some sprinkled in that are different translations as well. Uh, But yeah, if you would like to have a Bible, we would love, uh, we'd be pleased for you to take that gift from us. But Hebrews chapter 11, let's look at verses 1, 2, and 3. It says, now faith is the reality of what is hoped for, the proof of what is not seen. For by it our ancestors one God's approval. Verse 3, by faith we understand that the universe was created by the word of God so that what is seen was made from things that are not visible. Let us pray together. Lord Jesus, we thank you for this wonderful day you have blessed us with, this wonderful time of worship together. I thank you for the songs we already have have had as we rejoice uh, singing praises to you and your amazingly great name. God, I pray that Like all the people that will be mentioned today from this passage, I pray that we, by faith, would cling to you with every fiber of our being, Lord, that you would make us new, that you would chisel off any of the the, the yucky parts, the bad parts of us, that you would mold us and make us into whoever you would have us to be for you, Jesus, for your kingdom, for your glory, for your purposes. Be with us this day, make much of our time together in Christ's holy and wonderful name we all pray, amen. You may be seated. So I'll tell you, I have been challenged in a mighty way by God throughout this series. I, uh, I have never done a Hebrews uh, teaching series. And so then the Lord impressed upon me to, hey, do the entire book. I said, oh, all right, Lord. So this is probably the longest, I would say it is the longest sermon series I've taught before as well. Uh, but through the first 10 chapters... We have often discussed the superiority of Jesus Christ in a myriad of ways. Uh, We have shown that he is superior. The Bible has shown, that is. Uh, We have been challenged to be holy, pursue his holiness. We have been challenged to not squander 
our inheritance to be more mature Christians because, oh, by now some of us need to be off the, the milk and we need to be eating the, the meat and potatoes of Scripture more or less. We've, we've talked about these dangers of not progressing, moving forward, move forward, uh, not being stagnant in various ways. Uh, we, we have been warned to warned against not heeding his word and being obedient to it. We need to be in God's word. Uh, we've been talking about how to pursue godliness and as we persevere to the very end. We've covered so many topics, so many topics. Well, today is going to be an exciting day, I believe. Today we're going to talk about the greatest superpower of all time. All right, that's a fun topic, am I right? Yeah, I really enjoy comic book movies and things of that nature. I used to read it when I was a kid, and eh, I don't care so much about that now. But when I think of superpowers, I, I, I bet at some point in your life, as I have, you've been asked, if I could have any superpower, just one, which, which would you like to have? Some people will say things like super speed or super strength, or I'd love to be invisible, uh, or to be able to fly, or, or to teleport, well, for fun this morning, I gathered some fun answers from our children and from our teenagers. I'll start with the children. They were the ones I went to first. So I wish they were in here for this. Um, Roger, Roger had a really fun answer. Roger said, I want the ability to beat every single video game. That is a pretty fun power. Okay, I'll give him that. Zachary said he wanted to be able to change colors like a chameleon. That's a fun power. Uh, both uh, Heidi, my daughter, and Ella, they wanted ice power like Elsa. Um, my son Zane said, I'm going to go against that, and his favorite color is orange, so he wants to have fire power. Oh, you don't want it? You've changed your tune? Teleport and turn invisible. Sweet. All right. So Zeke, uh, my other boy, wants super speed. Lila gave probably my favorite answer. Lila wants to be able to turn into a mermaid. That is an interesting, fun answer there. <laughs> then our youth, well, they gave some more mature answers, still equally fun. Uh, Denton wants to be able to teleport, one of the ones that I had mentioned. Uh, and then Hero and Jackson both want to be able to manipulate time in some way. I'm okay with that. That'd be fun. I would never be late to anything. Uh, I would, yeah, yeah. I love my wife, but we, I was never late to anything until we got married. And uh, so, yes, I would love to be able, maybe to manipulate my wife, maybe not time. Um, I'm just kidding. I'm going to get in trouble for that one. But my, one that I would personally love, I would love to multiply myself so I can be at home and at the office all the time. That would be, ah, you don't need more of me. Oh, that hurts my feelings. Now she's zinging me back. So I did a few, uh, a few, <laughs> I've derailed this already. So I, I did a few poll searches, kind of looking into the most popular ones. And most of them I found really neat in that most said they would want to have healing powers, which was interesting because none of us said that. Healing powers were the most popular, and as a believer in Jesus, I was like, oh, that is cool. You know, the healing power of the Lord, for, of course, came to mind. So some might say, healing powers for yourself or for others? The simple answer is yes. Uh, they just said healing powers. And so as we look at Hebrews 11 today, I want us to see the greatest superpower in the Christian life, which is faith. Faith in Jesus Christ, not in your own superiority. You don't have any. Not in your own power that you have, because again, without Christ, you don't have any. Without Jesus, we are absolutely, I'm going to hurt your feelings, nothing. We're nothing without the Lord. So we are like those superheroes that we see in the movies. In a sense, we are like those men and women you see in those movies. They start off as these simple, ordinary, yet sin-filled people. That's what they are. And then they somehow get the powers and yada, yada, yada. But while we are simple, ordinary, sin-filled people, Christ still can and wants to use us to do extraordinary things through him and through him alone. It is not under your power or mine. It is only through the power of Jesus. 
And so as we look at this chapter, this chapter is a celebration. Uh, it's, a, it's a true celebration of faith. Uh, it shows us the transformative power uh, of faith in the lives of those who put their faith and trust in God. We see that faith isn't about uh, so much as obtaining immediate results as it's about maintaining hope, maintaining assurance in God's promises. And so the people mentioned here, they have often been called members of the Hall of Faith. You may have heard our heroes of the faith. A lot of us have heard that through the years. Uh, and, and they're called that because they inspire us to, to persevere despite their myriads of circumstances and uh, trusting that God's perfect plan, it will unfold in his perfect timing. And so going back to the first three verses, what we see here in, in these opening verses is essentially the description of faith. That's why I started by reading just those three. So to exercise faith essentially is to have confidence about an expectation without actually having visible proof that it'll happen. Well, how, how can that be? What makes this confidence possible? Well, it is the, the trustworthiness of our object of faith, God. So that begs the question, is God trustworthy? That's what we, I mean, we have to examine that. Is the Lord trustworthy? So faith is essentially like acting like God is telling us the truth. He's telling us the truth. He is who he says he is. He has done and he will do all that he has said and, and says he will. And so as we dive in today, I want you to notice that each member of this hall of faith here, they acted on what they believed. So let's dive into it. We got a pretty busy bulletin full of blanks today, if you're keeping up with that. Well, here's the first one. Look at verse four with me. It says, by faith, Abel offered to God a better sacrifice than Cain did. By faith, he was approved as a righteous man because God approved his gifts. And even though he is dead, he still speaks through his faith. So by faith, Abel worshiped. In this one verse, we see faith three times. The word faith is, is mentioned three times in the, in the Christian Standard Bible. But I think the key word here is mentioned twice. It is that God approved. That, to me, is the key word here. Well, you might think, what made Abel's sacrificial offering better than Cain's? Cain still, Cain still gave something. What makes, what makes Abel's so much better than Cain's? Well, look at Genesis 4. Let's look at 3 through 5. So, it says, in the course of time, Cain presented some of the land's produce as an offering to the Lord. And Abel also presented an offering, some of the firstborn of his flock and their fat portions. The Lord had regard for Abel and his offering. Yet in verse 5, he did not have regard for Cain and his offering. And Cain was furious. And he looked despondent. He was discouraged, right? Uh, just see him as a, a pouty boy here. So he's upset here. Well, okay, so why, are, why, why, is, why is Cain's not as good as Abel's? Well, Cain offered produce from the ground that was under the curse. That's what happened. But Abel, Abel listened and then obeyed God's command. He exercised dominion over the animals, Genesis 1, 28. So he exercises dominion over the animals and he offers the required sacrifice of shed blood. So in doing so, I, I picture Abel essentially having a conversation with God, something like this. God, I, I am a sinner. I, I know that my conduct, it is, it is inconsistent. I know that I've offended you. I deserve whatever punishment that you see fit uh, to, to give me. Lord, I, I have no hope but in you. And I know, Lord, I know that an atonement is necessary. Here it is. I, I pray for pardon through the shedding of blood. That's essentially what he, what he does. What you and I should take away from this is that true worship, true worship is not just singing some words that are on a screen or writing down stuff that I may have on the screen or following in our Bibles necessarily and uh, ho-hum drum, just, you know, I'm going through the motions, filling in these blanks. That's, that's not true worship in that sense. Those things can be worshipful in that sense, or we wouldn't use them, frankly. But what we should take away from this is that true worship must be what God will receive, not merely what we want to give. Because sometimes what we want to give is 
Kind of pitiful, isn't it? It's kind of, eh. That's a puny little gift you gave. The Lord just, I don't know, did everything for you, gave his all, but here, yeah, I'll give him this. I'll give him my leftovers. No, no. So Abel, uh, so in a sense, Abel doesn't just go up and here, let's pull up some flowers from the ground and say, hey, God, I got you some flowers. Here it is. Look what I got for you. He's like, what you got for me? You mean what I already made? So, but here's his flowers. Please take it. No, he offered God his very best, that very best animal. And he was, Abel was approved by God. His deeds were righteous and Cain was not. Cain was not righteous. We see that in 1 John chapter 3. Look at these two verses. <laughs> for this is the message you have heard from the beginning. We should love one another. Oh, that, I love this verse. Here we go. Oh, wait. Unlike Cain, <laughs> that's a sad thing for Cain. He was of the evil one, Satan, and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Because his deeds were evil and his brothers were righteous. He was evil. His brother was not. He was jealous of his brother. So he killed him. Hmm. And he's of Satan. Cain was not a child of God because he didn't have faith. He practiced religion, I have no doubt, but not righteousness. He didn't seek that. He didn't hunger and thirst for righteousness. He's, ah, I'll practice some stuff. Cool. You and I need to understand that showing up to church isn't sufficient. Cheeks and seats, that's not the same thing as worshiping the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. You just showed up. You're practicing religion by showing up. Yay. But are you worshipful when you're here? Are you worshipful at home? Um, are you worshipful out in the community? Yeah, yes, be a part of the church. We want you here. Please don't hear that ever. But we need to be worshipful while we're here, right? I don't want to just practice religion. Let's practice righteousness. And what's neat here, uh, as we look at verse 4, even though Abel's dead, he still speaks through his faith. Despite being murdered by Cain, Abel's legacy lives on today as he is the first martyr of the faith. And his faith teaches us that access to God's presence is through the blood. We see it right here. Oh, I want that kind of legacy. How about you? I, I want a life that some, somebody could say at my funeral, Daryl lived a life that pointed others to the truth and his obedience to the Lord. I don't care what other things you want to say at my funeral. That's the main thing I want you to say, period. And I want that said of me. I want that to be true. Let's not just say it. Oh, man, that I would worship like Abel. Look at verses 5 and 6. By faith, Enoch was taken away, and so he did not experience death. He was not to be found because God took him away. For before he was taken away, he was approved, there's that word again, as one who pleased God. Now, without faith, it is impossible to please God, since the one who draws near to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. So here's your second one. By faith, Enoch walked. He walked. Now, you and I, we know the importance of walking to help us stay physically fit. It's a very good practice for all of us to walk. But better than, better than that is spiritual fitness that is found by walking with the Lord. Go back to Genesis. Look at chapter 5, 22 through 24. It says, And after he fathered Methuselah, Enoch walked with God 300 years and fathered other sons and daughters. So Enoch's life lasted 365 years. Enoch, there it is, walked with God. Then he was not there because God took him. To walk with God is to keep in step with him right? Don't run ahead of him, but also don't get too far behind. As we walk together, <clears throat> what that allows us to do is we get to talk with the Lord. We, uh-oh, listen to the Lord. Mm, that's speaking at me sometimes. Be still and know, Daryl, that he is God. Hush up. Listen to him, okay? Enjoy his presence. So, wow, I get to Walk and talk and enjoy his presence. And, uh, hmm. I don't know about you, but it makes me think of a song. 
And he walks with me, and he talks with me, and he tells me I am his own. And the joy we share as we tarry there, none other has ever known. Right? In the garden. Great song. And we, we trust, as we do these things, we trust his guidance. When I can't see what's around that corner. I don't know what's coming ahead, but I'm with him. He's leading the way. So if something dangerous is happening, he will probably shift over here to protect me from it. Or if I am pursuing him and he sees fit for me to die for his kingdom, that's what's going to happen. And so either way, I'm with him. He's in my presence, I'm in his presence, and it's an exciting, delightful life that I live, and I don't have to worry about what lies ahead, because he's there. You know, I kind of think of our five kiddos going to a Sam's Club parking lot is stressful. So you got 47 big carts as well as 80 cars, and apparently some big yellow pole I'm supposed to worry about over there as well that everybody runs into. And so... (laughs) That's a hilarious thing. Apparently, that poll has its own Facebook page. That's really funny to me. Anyway, somebody created a page for it. So, um, yeah, it's, that's funny. Anyway, so we, uh, we walk through the parking lot. And, of course, you know, if Katie and I are over here, yeah, let's just sling the kids over there where all the traffic's coming. Of course not. We're going to have them on this side, and we're going to be on the outside as the traffic comes through. And then, of course, we're still watching to make sure there's nobody backing up. Right? So we're watching intently and turning heads around. Hey, Zeke, look, look, look up. That's not what I said to do. Look forward. You know what I meant. Super literal. That's what he does. And so, <laughs> uh, cracks me up. Anyway, but I, I picture the Lord doing that. Hey, something is up ahead. So he's going to shift wherever he needs to be to protect us or to have us right out there serving him. And so he, he knows what he's doing. We can trust in his guidance. And it, to me, it's not just the destination that's important. It's the journey that we take together. You know, I, I love the journey together, Lord. I, I, it's, it's great. Now, that song, In the Garden, I don't know about you, but I often associate it with funerals. That's where I hear it more than anything else. I hear that song at, like, everybody's funeral. I'm like... I love y'all. Don't play that song at my funeral. I love it, but it's overdone. Don't play in the garden at my funeral. If that's you, sorry. That's fine. You can play it if you want to. Um, but, what, but what's funny to me is as I picture this being a funeral song, more or less, Enoch didn't have one. Right? Notice that. He didn't die because he pleased God. Enoch walked with God and consider the time he lived. He walked with God in an incredibly wicked world before the flood. Genesis chapter 5 happens, and then boom. Genesis 6, God tells Noah, mm, I'm going to get rid of everybody. You need to build a boat. And chapter 7, flood, right? So the Lord and his grace, oh, just his grace to Enoch says, I don't want him to experience that. He takes him. That's a, wow, that's a wonderful blessing. And so, oh, you know what that means, Daryl? That that means if I please him, I won't die. That's not what I'm saying. That's not what it's saying either. Um, I just told you, and the Bible just told you, Abel died a violent death. So that's that's not the case. God has a different plan for each one of us who trusts in him. So what it does mean, though, is that Enoch's departure from this world was a direct result of how he lived. Man, don't don't you want God to be pleased with you? I do. Well, that happens only by faith. Only when we have faith in God will our obedience then be pleasing to him. Now, some will say, will say that the, uh, the opposite of faith is doubt, and I can understand why they would think that, but I actually think the opposite of faith is disobedience. Um, I, I choose to walk with him. I could also choose to, eh, I don't want to fool with that. I could choose, I choose to walk with with him, and I pray that, that you do too, because there's no better time. Oh, look around. There is no better time than now to begin walking with God, because each day, every single step counts. 
And those steps are infinitely more important than the steps recorded on your Fitbit or whatever you have, right? Those steps of the Lord are more important than those physical steps. Oh, God, may I be in step with you. Help me to walk as Enoch walked. Look at verse 7. By faith, Noah, after he was warned about what was not yet seen and motivated by godly fear, he built an ark to deliver his family. By faith, he condemned the world and became an heir of the righteousness that comes by faith. Man, there's some by faiths going on, three of them in just that one verse. Hmm. So here we see, by faith, Noah worked. And before we look at Noah's work, I want you to see that he and Enoch have something in common in the very next chapter of Genesis. It was Genesis 5, and now we're looking at 6. By the way, we saw 4 with Cain and Abel, so there's a theme going on here. Here's Genesis 6. These are the family records of Noah. Who was Noah? Well, he was a righteous man, blameless among his contemporaries. Oh, and what's that last part? Noah walked with God. So he has that in common with Enoch, right? Well, Noah took God seriously and he acted. Think of the ridicule that Noah faced during all of this. It's pretty insane to me to think about that. There's a 120-year gap. If you don't know, there's a 120-year gap between God's command to build the ark and the flood. Now, you and I have met some crazy people in our lives. I'm certain of it. You're probably related to some. But that's a long time for everybody around you to think you're nuts. 120 years, <laughs> Noah's the weird guy. And I think it's really cool, especially in today's society where people like to just vandalize and tear up and burn police stations, do all sorts of nonsense. Isn't it wonderful that nobody burned the ark? Nobody, uh, I don't even see it recorded in Scripture. Like, nobody tried to do anything harmful. The, the Lord protected what Noah was doing. And all that time, well, everybody thinks he's nuts. But despite people thinking he was crazy... He believed God, and he obeyed a command that didn't make any sense. I'd have a lot of questions if I were Noah. First off, Lord, what, what is rain? Seriously, according to Genesis 2.5, it had not rained. The Lord had not yet brought rain. So you're asking me to build this humongous boat on dry land, but you're telling me about this rain stuff, these floodwaters. Well, uh, oh, okay, Lord, but what is, what, what, what is rain? All right. But Noah was faithful anyway. He saved his entire family. And in doing so, the rest of the world was condemned. Noah's faith further revealed their unbelief. Look at the difference. Here's Noah. Here's everybody else. Wow. In Noah's day, the people, they were involved in sinful activities daily. They completely ignored Noah's witness. As Peter says in 2 Peter uh, 2, 5, he calls it Noah's preaching. They ignored Noah's preaching. And in the midst of, of a self-centered and incredibly violent generation, Noah put his faith, he put his trust in the Lord. Well, how about you? How, how, about, how about me? I'm going to be real. I think we live in a similar time. As you look around, we, it feels like it, doesn't it? Will you work for the Lord even if people... Ignore your preaching? Ignore your witness? Let's back up a minute. Are you preaching? Are you witnessing? That's step number one. You need to do those things. But you're not doing it for them. The people think you might be crazy for doing so. We're doing it for the Lord. We don't live for this world. You and I belong to a greater kingdom than this. And so the Lord... He, he compels us as believers in Jesus, every single one. I don't know what you're called to, but it is not to sit on your duff and do nothing, right? I don't know what everybody's called to. I don't know your spiritual strengths and weaknesses. Some of you I know more than others, and we can kind of gauge some of those things together. But every single one of us is called to share the good news as a believer in Jesus. Why would you not want to? I want people to have what I have in the Lord. It's not, a, I got Jesus, you can't have him. Oh, why would I do that? But when people ignore your witness that you should be giving, don't let it bother you. You don't work for them. We're working for the Lord. So that's key. So work like Noah worked because of your faith. Works don't save us, but works show that we are believers and followers in Christ Jesus. 
Let's look at the longest part together. Let's look at, start at verse 8. By faith, Abraham, when he was called, obeyed and set out for a place that he was going to receive as an inheritance. And he went out even though he did not know where he was going. Verse 9, by faith, he stayed as a foreigner in the land of promise, living in tents, as did Isaac and Jacob, co-heirs of the same promise. For he was looking forward to the city that has foundations, whose architect and builder is God. Amen. Verse 11, by faith, even Sarah herself, when she was unable to have children, received power to conceive offspring, even though she was past the age, since she considered that the one who had promised was faithful. Therefore, from one man, in fact, from one as good as dead, came offspring as numerous as the stars of the sky and as innumerable as the grains of sand along the seashore. 13, these all died in faith, although they had not received the things that were promised, but they saw them from a distance, greeted them, and confessed that they were foreigners and temporary residents on the earth. Now, those who say such things make it clear that they are seeking a homeland. If they were thinking about where they came from, they would have had an opportunity to return, but they now desire a better place in verse 16, a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. Verse 17, by faith, Abraham, when he was tested, he offered up Isaac, and he received the promises, and yet he was offering his one and only son, the one to whom it had been said, your offspring will be traced through Isaac. He considered God to be able even to raise someone from the dead, therefore he received him back, figuratively speaking. Verse 20, by faith, Isaac blessed Jacob and Esau concerning things to come. By faith, Jacob, when he was dying, he blessed each of the sons of Joseph and he worshiped, leaning on the top of his staff. By faith, Joseph, as he was nearing the end of his life, mentioned the exodus of the Israelites and gave instructions concerning his bones. So let's stop there for a second. So what we see in these 15 verses, 8 through 22, what we see is by faith, the, the patriarchs waited. These, they waited. These men, these women, they trusted God, and their faith was followed by obedience to him. The big emphasis in this whole section is on the promise of God and his plans for the nation of Israel. We, we know the nation began with the call of Abraham. He and Sarah, they were promised a son, but they had to wait 25 years to see that promise fulfilled. How many of us would give up after 25 years? Probably 25 months, right? So many people that we, we just, I don't, I don't know, man. The Lord, you're just, you, you just make empty promises. No, he doesn't. Just wasn't on your time frame. 25 years of waiting. In that time, what was the Lord doing? He was getting them spiritually prepared. And then their promised son, Isaac, what happens to him? He fathers Jacob and Esau. But it was Jacob that really built the nation through the birth of his 12 sons. Then his son, Joseph, what happened? He saved the nation in the land of Egypt. And then Moses would later deliver them from Egypt. But man, I have such admiration for these these patient patriarchs, this waiting process. Is waiting hard for some of y'all? Oh, yeah. <laughs> that was real quick, yes. Waiting is tremendously hard for me at times. I get very impatient, which is not a great quality, and I'm, I'm, I'm praying for those things, and I, I pray the Lord will, will get, get, just take that away from me. I want patience, and I want it right now. No, it doesn't work like that. While it's hard to do, true faith is able to wait for the fulfillment of God's promises and God's time. Not mine, not yours. The creator of time. You can put a creator of time on a time crutch. <laughs> Good luck. No. While we're waiting, though, what must we do? We must obey. Look at verse 8. Abraham, when he was called, obeyed and set out for a place that he didn't know where he was going. He obeyed. He lived in tents as a stranger in the world, ready to move whenever God said so. Let's go, wherever you say, Lord. Christians today, we are also strangers in this world. Look at 1 Peter 2.11. Dear friends, I urge you as strangers and exiles to abstain from sinful desires that wage war against the soul. This fallen world is not your home. This fallen world is not your home. 
Please understand that. Please know that. Consider, I would consider this a pit stop more or less on the way to eternity. That's what this is. Our job in the interim time then is to make a difference for God in the world. Not say, ah, what's the difference? No, make a difference. Don't do what everybody else is doing. Abstain from sinful desires that wage war against us, against the soul. I don't want to do what everybody else does. I shouldn't. So Abraham, we see in verse 10, he has his eyes on the heavenly city. Shouldn't we? Oh, man. Lord, I want my, fix my eyes on you, Lord, at all times and what your kingdom provides. We are, let me say this. I don't know if y'all know this, but I think our country's in some pretty good disarray. I I think the flag should probably be hung upside down. (laughs) Help, we need some help, right? Isn't that the, that what we're supposed to do? With the dysfunction, the distress, that's the word I was looking for. It was a dis something, disarray, distress, dysfunction. I think we cover it all, disrespect. Yeah, we got every bit of the disses, don't we? Man, but let me say this. While we're citizens here, and I love our country, don't get me wrong, but I want you to hear this loud and clear. We are citizens of a better country, and we are strangers and exiles in this land. Regardless of who wins the presidency, Jesus is Lord. He sits on the throne. Now vote with the Bible, period. Um, I'll absolutely say that to you. But Jesus is Lord, regardless of who wins. Read the back of this book. We do. Because we're believers in Christ Jesus. We win. You've already won as a believer in the Lord, if you are, assuming you are. And we're waiting on this pit stop that the Lord has called us to. All right, Lord, help us navigate us. And when we get to whining and bellyaching about who won the election or whatever goes down, help us to see, Lord, that you are the reason to even have reason. You are it. Number one, the end all be all. And we serve a greater kingdom. Help us to serve that country, Lord. So Abraham, we see he believed, he obeyed God when he didn't know God's will. He didn't know when it would be accomplished. He didn't know what it was necessarily. And these people of faith, we see they lived in tents. But they knew a heavenly city awaited them. I got a mansion waiting for me. I can live in a tent for a bit. And then we see Paul does that. He's a tent maker, right? Later on in the New Testament. So I was like, hey, okay. But as we look at verses 17 through 19, I think this is what a hard challenge, right? Abraham's Faith and trust in the Lord was such that he, he says, look, I'll receive Isaac back. Why would the Lord make us wait 25 years just to take him from us? I mean, he, no. But imagine you being Abraham, and you're asked to sacrifice your, your, your boy. That's a big ask, right? But he says, I, I have enough faith. I believe Isaac will be back. He trusted in God's divine intervention. We can expect the same if we live by faith. Let's be real. We have done a lot. There's a lot of divine intervention happening right here in this prayer room. Every week, 20 plus of you come in here, and I love how busy this prayer room is. And I don't know how you pray, what you pray, the posture in which you pray, but the Lord answers our prayers. Amen? Wow. In the ways that we're, we seek. And there'll be times where he, he doesn't. He'll, he'll say no, or he'll say not right now, or maybe you're praying incorrectly, praying with selfish motives, so maybe that's not the one I'm going to answer. Oh, but when we earnestly seek him and we're on our face, on our knees to the Lord, watch his divine intervention. Oh, some of you can attest to that personally. Physical health, spiritual health, uh, somebody you've been praying for for years and years accepts Christ. I mean, lots of things. And we can expect that when we live by faith in Jesus. I don't know if you've noticed the theme, but by faith, by faith, by faith, by faith, by faith. How many times have we seen it already? And Abraham, Isaac, 
Jacob and Joseph, what we have is we have four generations of faith. And as a parent, man, sometimes don't we want our kids to have a certain, I don't know, a certain set of skills that we do? I would, I would tell you freely, I'd love my boys to be pastors. I think that'd be awesome. I think that'd be so cool to me. We want, we want our kids to like the things that we like and to dislike the things that we dislike. I, would, I want that as well, probably. And as a dad, I know full well that I will pass on many things to my kids, good or bad. Unfortunately, the bad. But I want to make sure of this. I want to make sure that I pass them the baton of faith and God more than anything else. And so as I look at these guys, I admire their faith here. They, they didn't have a complete Bible, and yet their faith was strong. They handed God's promises down from one generation to the next. And in spite of their failures that are also recorded over and over in Scripture, just not here, these men and these women, they believed God. And what did he do? He bore witness to their faith. But how much more faith should you and I have? We have an entire Bible right here. 66 books right here. God's word, the entirety of it. We should all obediently serve him as we wait then. Persevere, wait. And when you think you're done waiting, wait some more. Wait. Look at verse 23. By faith, Moses, after he was born, was hidden by his parents for three months because they saw that the child was beautiful and they didn't fear the king's edict. By faith, Moses, when he had grown up, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter and chose to suffer with the people of God rather, to en rather than enjoy the fleeting pleasure of sin. For he considered repro reproach for the sake of Christ to be greater wealth than the treasures of Egypt. Wow. Since he was looking ahead, there it is again, the heavenly place. I'm looking ahead to the reward. Verse 27, by faith he left Egypt behind, not being afraid of the king's anger. For Moses persevered as one who sees him who is invisible. By faith he instituted the Passover and the sprinkling of the blood so that the destroyer of the firstborn might not touch the Israelites. And then we see by faith they crossed the Red Sea as though they were on dry land. When the Egyptians attempted to do this, they were drowned because our God is bigger. So by faith, what did Moses do? He waged war. Whew. But we see again the importance here of, of believing parents. Not fearing the king's edict, that would certainly take faith on their part. Amram and Jochebed were his parents' names. Those are awesome names you won't find on a, on a necklace or a keychain or whatever. <laughs> you won't find that. But they, that certainly took, took faith on their part, right? Now, children, they're not automatically Christians because mom and dad are. Of course not. But godly parents, what do you do, parents? You create an atmosphere of faith in your home, and you're a godly Christian example to your kids. And if you're not, why not? Your home is the first school of faith for your child. If you think they're going to learn it at a public school or even some home schools, you're sadly wrong. You are the number one spot. You are it. How are you living, dad, leading your home? How are you living, mom, as you submit to dad, but also lead your home? How do we do this? Well, by faith. By faith as you dive into God's word together as a family. Show them the importance of God's word. Show them the importance of coming to church. Show them the importance of living for Jesus. Show them the importance of, of Christians having fun. It's not boring, as the world wants to tell you, but you are the, your home is the first school of faith for your child. We see Moses, some of the greatest themes of faith are seen in his life. We see his refusal to adopt their faith. Verses 24 and 25, he, here he is. He's the adopted son of an Egyptian princess. He could have easily had the life and the palace would have been wonderful, right? Filled with earthly pleasures, all the women and sin he wants and, and drinking and doing whatever. Full of sin and debauchery. Yeah, he can have that. But he chooses instead to identify with God's suffering people. Wow. I'm going to choose suffering over the palace. He had the right values. He made the right decisions. 
And in verse 26, I mentioned it. Notice he's looking ahead to the heavenly city as well. He's looking ahead to the reward. And the writer of Hebrews, he again gives us this common theme uh, in verse 27, this common theme of perseverance. We see that, perseverance. Moses persevered as one who sees him who is invisible. By choosing faith over fear, Moses was able to face Pharaoh. He trusted God to deal with his enemy. God will take care of Pharaoh. And his faith was rewarded with deliverance for him and his people. When we trust God, what we see is we we get what he can do. But when we trust ourselves, we get only what weak people can do. Don't put your faith in stock in me. Don't put your faith in stock in someone else. Put your faith in your trust in Jesus Christ. I will let you down. The Lord's promises, <laughs> they always reign true. They always will. I won't do it on purpose, but I'll let you down. I'll break a promise that I didn't mean to break. The Lord doesn't do that. <laughs> Moses' experience shows us proof that biblical faith means obeying God in spite of circumstances and consequences. Anybody else deal with consequences and circumstances in life? Of course we do. Bad decisions, we all live with that. But Moses shows us here, faith, I'm just, I'm going to obey God in spite of all the things, and in spite of these stumbling blocks, these roadblocks in my path even, despite the persecution that may come because of my faith in Jesus. Man, I would rather have nothing on this side of heaven, and I can wait for that palace that awaits, that mansion. But more than that, man, I can wait for the king that I will get to celebrate with. Look at verse 30. Notice it skips some time here from 29 to 30. It doesn't talk about all of the years of wandering in the wilderness because this is the faith passage here, right? So we're going to it, it doesn't do that, but it goes straight into verse 30. By faith, the walls of Jericho fell down after being marched around by the Israelites for seven days. By faith, Rahab the prostitute welcomed the spies in peace and didn't perish with those who disobeyed. Oh, we need to stop there. Wait a minute. What, Daryl? Rahab too? Yeah. By faith, Joshua and Rahab won. Well, wait a minute. Rahab is a prostitute. We know that's not a Christ-like quality. She's a prostitute, and you're telling me she gets recognized alongside Abraham, Moses, and, and, and Joshua? How? How is that possible? How is that right? Well, I could easily tell you Isaiah 55 that says, <laughs> Lord says, my ways are not your ways. That's how. But I could also simplify it with one word here, faith. God, in his mercy and in his grace, he permitted Rahab to live, but she was ultimately saved by her faith. She knew, she had heard, so she knew that God had delivered Israel from Egypt and had opened the Red Sea. But honestly, in that passage, the Joshua 2 passage, that had been 40 years ago. But she still knew about it. She also knew that God had defeated the other nations during all these wanderings of Israel. She knew. She had heard it all. And in fact, her people group, what were they? Hmm, look at Joshua 2.11. When we heard this, ah, they lost heart. Everyone's courage failed because of you. We know, or I know, the Lord your God is God in heaven above and on earth below. And they knew they were going to be defeated. They knew it. This was her testimony of faith. The Lord your God is God in heaven above and on earth below. She knows it. Her testimony of faith and God honored it. And then her true faith showed itself in her good works as she protected the spies. Not only was Rahab delivered from judgment, but she actually became a part of the nation of Israel. Uh, she married a guy who, yes, his name was Salmon. <laughs> she marries a guy named Salmon and gives birth to Boaz, who is an ancestor of King David, who we know, of course, is in the line of Christ. So imagine, imagine a pagan harlot becoming a part of the ancestry of Jesus Christ. That church is what faith can do. Rahab, she stands up as, she says, as one of the greatest women of faith in the Bible. So I want you to hear this. If you're discouraged, I'm not good enough, woe is me, and yada, yada. If you're discouraged and you feel like giving up, throwing in the towel, remember this. God makes spiritual heroes 
out of some extremely unlikely people. Mm. Yeah, so be, be encouraged by that. Look at verse 32. And what more can I say? Time is too short for me to tell about Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, David, Samuel, and the prophets who by faith conquered kingdoms, administered justice, obtained promises, shut the mouths of lions, quenched the raging of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, gained strength and weakness, became mighty in battle, and put foreign armies to flight. Women received their dead, raised to life again. Let's, but what if we just stop there? That all sounds wonderful. But, but what happens next? Other people were tortured, not accepting release so that they might gain a better resurrection. Verse 36, others experienced mockings and scourgings, as well as bonds and imprisonment. They were stoned. They were sawed in two. They died by the sword. They wandered around in sheepskins and goatskins, destitute, afflicted, and mistreated. And the world was not worthy of them, verse 38 says. They wandered in deserts and on mountains, hiding in caves and holes in the ground. And all these, verse 39 says, were approved through their faith, but they did not receive what was promised, since God had provided something better for us, so that they would not be made perfect without us. Hmm. The world neither approved of or deserved them, but God applauded them. We must understand this then. You cannot please both the world and God. You're not going to do both. Stop riding that fence. Let's just kick that fence down. And you pick a side you're going to live for. I don't care anything about this fence. So knowing that we can't please both, we shouldn't try to do so. We should seek the Lord's approval over man's approval. Now, I'm going to be real. Lips can sometimes get boring, can't they? Oh, not this one. Not this one in Hebrews 11. It's an impressive list of these Old Testament believers, their amazing accomplishments. And this chapter uses the word faith or variations of it. We see faithful 28 times in 40 years. The phrase by faith is 22 of those. So through faith, these people obtained a good testimony we see in verse 39. But was there always a good outcome? <laughs> man, we, we just looked at it. The, the writer highlighted those who, by faith, man, some conquered kingdoms, and they shut the mouths of lions, and they escaped the edge of the sword. And then he mentions these others who were, I don't know, tortured and killed. <laughs> Which would you choose to be? I mean, conquering kingdoms sounds pretty good, Lord. I'm okay without that torturing and killing stuff. So those that were tortured and killed, I guess they didn't, they, their faith just wasn't good enough. That wouldn't happen if they'd been people living for, for the Lord, right? That's not what it says at all. No. <laughs> Did they obtain a bad testimony? No. Look at verse 39. It says, all these were approved through their faith. Both the delivered and the undelivered obtained a good testimony for all had acted in faith. Now, I'm certain that all of them had asked the Lord for help. Some received deliverance. Others received an answer that I think is, is similar to the one Paul was given when he pleaded, oh, Lord, take this thorn from me. He removed. And what did the Lord say? Look at 2 Corinthians 12, 9. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. My power, excuse me, is perfected in weakness. Therefore, Paul says, I will most gladly boast all the more about my weaknesses so that Christ's power may reside in me. Man, be greatly encouraged then. Whenever you act in faith and in God's strength, you are obtaining a good testimony before him, no matter what the outcome. Now, that doesn't stop us from asking at times, oh, how can I maintain faith during times of, of persecution or, or hardship? Well, I would tell you by this, by knowing and living Romans 8, 37. In all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. This is going to look familiar, the next thing on the screen for you. By faith, we are more than conquerors through him who loves us. We read in verse 6. It's impossible. Without faith, it's, it's impossible to please God. We, we see that. This kind of faith grows then as we listen to his word. The last verse of the day, Romans 10, 17. So faith comes from what is heard, 
And what is heard comes through the message about Christ. So we need to have what we're doing today. We need to hear God's word preached. We need to teach it in our homes. We need to be studying it on the regular. I need to hear from the Lord. Well, I don't, I don't know what God's plan is for me. I don't hear him. Are you reading the Bible? What, what, what have you been reading lately? Well, you know, I've been busy. I've got a lot going on. Hmm. So what you have is excuses. Okay. I got gotcha. you. Huh. Well, I just want to hear God audibly. You've heard me say it before. Get an audio Bible. You want to hear God audibly speaking to you? His word speaks clearly to us. You just have to open it or read it. How many apps? You got five apps on your phone that are Bibles probably, some of us. You got plenty of ways you can do this. We need to grow as we listen to his word. We also... We also need fellowship together, yes? Fellowship like this, fellowship and worship, fellowship and praying together, fellowship and eating. You know, we'll eat up some food as Baptists, right? We'll do that. But we need those things. But I want you to hear this. Faith is possible to all kinds of believers in all kinds of situations. And it is a necessity for all of God's people. So here's my final prayer for the day. I pray that the Lord would increase your faith, and mine. Oh, I pray, God, that you would increase, that I would decrease, that my faith in you could move mountains, as your word says, Lord. I pray that over you. And I'll say this, if you've not put your faith and trust in Jesus, you're missing out on the greatest thing of all time. You're missing out. We've seen wonderful examples from Hebrews 11, and I challenge you to to look at more, look up more. There's plenty of others all in God's word. You're not going to live a life worth living without Jesus. Life is worth the living just because he lives, right? We sing that song, and it is. Because Jesus lives, you and I can face tomorrow. Heck, I can face the rest of today. Lord, I need you right now. I'm going to need you in five minutes. And if Jesus had come back, let's say, we'll use that five minutes concept, If Jesus had come back five minutes ago, how many of you would still be sitting right where you are? That that should convict you if you're like, I don't know. I don't know means no. You, You would be right here. I want you to know that you know that you know that you are a believer in Jesus. You are saved, you're seeking his will, and you're following him by faith. Watch what he can do. You're not going to do it well on your own. You'll try. You'll fall on your face. You'll get up. You'll have some good days. You'll try. You'll fall on your face. And it's a vicious cycle. As a believer in Jesus, check this out. You'll try and you'll fall on your face. And you'll get up and you'll try and you'll fall on your face. There's a major difference, though. Jesus picks you up. You're not getting on your own and Picking yourself up off the floor or waiting for a lost world to pick you up. Forget that, right? And we as believers can pick each other up as we seek by faith to live for Christ Jesus our Lord. Church, what has he done for us? Everything. How little we really do for him. I pray that that would be a conviction to you. It is to me. And I pray that we would honor him with our actions. I pray that we would honor him with our lips Oh, let no unclean things come from my lips, Lord. I pray that over you as well. But if you don't know Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior, it needs to be a personal thing. I pray now, right here in this moment. I'll pray over you. I'd love to pray with you. If you want to walk down and pray with me or raise your hand, I'll come to you. I'll turn this off. Nobody has to hear your business. That's fine. Or if you want to wait out here in the foyer, I'll I'll, I'll hang out till you're gone. I love you too much to, to let that moment pass by. But don't let some weird, awkward, oh, I don't want to get up in front of people, bother you. By faith, walk down. Put your faith in Jesus. You can pray here. You can pray with me. However, the Lord sees fit for you to do. But surrender your very life to him this day. Oh, I pray the Lord increases that for you. Let's pray. Jesus, you are wonderful. We thank you for all that you are. God, I thank you for the heroes of the faith. Lord, I know 40 verses is a lot to tackle in one day. But God, I love these examples in your word. I pray that my faith would be strong for you. 
I pray that I would lead my house the way you'd have me. I pray that I'd be ready when I come into your house of praise, house of worship uh, at, at this church, but also the house of praise and worship in my own home. I pray that I would be the spiritual leader you've called me to be. I pray over our Sunday school leaders. I pray for our men's ministry, our women's ministry. God, I, I pray for every facet, our, our, our kitchen, our Awana team, everybody, Lord. I pray that we are doing your will. God, help us to increase our faith in you as well. Or be with that person here today that doesn't know you as their Savior. They're putting a lot of stock in finances, or they're putting a lot of stock in something else. But today, Lord, I, I earnestly plead that they would put their faith in you. We love you. We thank you for all that you do and for who you are. It's in Jesus' holy name we all pray.